is it indicating that the economy is just stalling globally? I mean, I think you're seeing indications that uh, global growth is going to be slowing, and that's just going to go in tandem with the rising rate environment. Uh, you had a, a lot of uh, money come, you know, wash. Everyone was flush with money coming out of the uh, pandemic when they really were rejecting capital in the market. You had a zero interest rate environment. And that is going to be one of the primary drivers of inflation, which we've seen and we're experiencing. Uh, and to fight that inflation, they've obviously looked to raise rates as one of the tools to do that. And that's ultimately going to have a drag on all sorts of business when your cost of capital goes up. We're talking about the future of base metals and perhaps what will happen to the economy uh, with our next guest, uh, Max Porterfield, president and CEO of Kalinex Mines. Uh, copper in particular is the focus of our discussion today. Is it a good gauge for what is about to happen to our economy and why? Mac, welcome back to the show, Max. Good to see you again. Nice to see you as well. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here today. We spoke about uh, five months ago in September. Lots have happened uh, in the world. New updates uh, with not just our economy, global geopolitics, but also uh, copper. Let's start with uh, world events. And so last time we spoke, you and I had talked about the slowing down of China, weighing down on the copper price. Um, now, the, the slowdown of China is not a short-term theme. It's sort of a longer-term um, phenomenon that people have observed. Is that is that still kind of the um, impetus behind copper price not breaking out right now? Well, I think you've had just uh, global uncertainty in terms of growth, uh, the rising interest rate environment to try to uh, fight inflation, I think is really dragging on things. And so that's certainly going to erode at some demand, but longer term, the supply demand fundamentals are, are favoring, favoring much higher prices. Um, many are calling for a big move in copper later this year. And I, I definitely think that that could be in the cards for us. Yeah, tell us about some of these uh, demand demand supply fundamentals and what why why you think that there's going to be a big push. Well, really, it's on the supply side. I mean, if you look at uh, well, first on the demand side, you you obviously have the EV story and the growing demand for uh, copper through the EV and infrastructure around that. You also have global infrastructure spending that's going to be necessary uh, as the Western economies rebuild infrastructure, and you still have the you know, emerging economies building infrastructure and projects around that's going to drive base metal demand. But on top of the, and the EV demand is still there and very much in place. Uh, you know, I think that's, you know, even if it gets eroded, the expectations of the demand that was coming online was going to dwarf supply irrespectively. Uh, on the supply side, and I think the supply side is a real story, is a lack of exploration in these aging mines globally. I mean, mine supply isn't infinite. Uh, life of mine can be extended and, and oftentimes is extended, but all good things come to an end. Just like in, in the area of uh, Manitoba we're exploring, uh, there was a mine that was there at 18-year you know, mine life, and it just recently shut down. Uh, it was a big producer of copper, uh, in particular high-grade copper, and you're going to see more and more of that happening. But at the same time, you've had a lack of investment on the exploration side for new discoveries to be made in the copper space, and that's been... Uh, most part because of the lack of really any kind of move and excitement in, in the copper space until really the past, call it 24 months, where you've had that move to $5 and copper is now stabilizing just under four. So that's going to underpin higher prices moving forward. And you can't just turn on exploration and, and see new discoveries take place. Uh, and it's a, really a long term game. Uh, on the development side of things, there's also a longer path to get a mine into production. As you know, these the ESG is put even more uh, and highlighted in this higher government regulations around the world for mine supply to come online. So again, the average copper mine to come online seven years once it's discovered and, and goes past the development stage. Okay, uh, which jurisdictions help help us um, a little bit more about the copper market here? Which jurisdictions in the world have the highest concentration of uh, high grade copper? Well, high grade copper, you're going to look to Central Africa namely the DRC. In the DRC, you're looking on average 2 to 3% copper grades on the deposits in the DRC. Uh, the Kukula deposit uh, that's owned by Ivanhoe, owned and operated by Ivanhoe Mines, uh, that's averaging, I think, just about 6% copper. So exceptionally high-grade coppers, uh, copper grades out of Central Africa, but there's geopolitical risk associated with that production. 
Uh, and to compare those grades, the average global mine grade of copper today is less than half a percent. Uh, so uh, again, you've got diminishing grades on a global basis and geopolitical risks associated where you get some of the highest grades around the world, uh, which is again going to be where you're going to see the most profitable mines are going to be the richest ones typically. Dr. Copper is, uh, is, is often referred to on Wall Street. It's often seen as a key global indicator for growth. Um, it often portends economic activity uh, and a global recession if the price is low. Is that something that you've observed or is that just sort of like a myth? No, that's certainly uh, not a myth. That's 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 certainly real. I mean, uh, it is a build, it's a called a base metal because it's a building block of the global economy. Uh, so that's what's really quite promising. What you're seeing is, is is while copper copper prices haven't outperformed uh, the expectations that you know everyone's had for the the price action in the, in the commodity, it has stabilized even with these global growth concerns. So we're not looking at a situation where we've got copper prices going back down to, to two dollars a pound. Uh, you've got copper at three eighty four this morning, and so again that is indicative of the supply demand fundamentals. I think it's a very very tight market. And on either side of the equation, whether you have a mine supply issue and or some kind of promising demand numbers coming online in the future for you know economic growth or you know reducing rates or something like that, uh, you can have a significant move because of how tight the market is. And you know I say sniffing four dollar copper right now is a really resilient copper price. Do you think that copper is um, indicative of a slowdown right now? I mean, I, I'll just get straight to it. The price has been hovering around three dollars and eighty four cents uh, U.S. Uh, if you take a look at a five year chart, uh, it peaked around twenty twenty two, near five dollars, but uh, it's it's come down ever since. And ever since uh, twenty twenty three, it's just been hovering around a range. Um, is it indicating that the economy is just stalling globally? I mean, I think you're seeing indications that. Uh, global growth is going to be slowing, and that's just going to go in tandem with the rising rate environment. Uh, you had a, a lot of uh, money come, you know, wash. Everyone was flush with money and coming out of the uh, pandemic when they really were rejecting capital in the market. You had a zero interest rate environment, and that is going to be one of the primary drivers of inflation, which we've seen and we're experiencing. Uh, and to fight that inflation, they've obviously looked to raise rates as one of the tools to do that. And that's ultimately going to have a drag on all sorts of business when your cost of capital goes up. So, yeah, certainly I do think it's a part, plays a part. But the fact that we're not at like a $250 or $2 copper price, uh, where we have in other financial crises, is a you know strong sign of the tight supply demand fundamentals that are in place. Um, at the end of the day, you can't have demand erosion, but that's not going to solve the supply side of the equation. You know, there is a lack of mine supply coming online, and that lack of mine supply coming online is driven by a lack of exploration for new discoveries. Those discoveries are becoming more and more challenging to make. Uh, and then you also have the development timeline. So when you have a lack of investment on the supply side for over a decade, which is really what you've seen in the copper space, because of a lack of incentive by a you know higher copper price that would incentivize explorers like ourselves to go out and explore for, for base metal mines. That's what's leading to the supply constraint right now. And then you have government policy with the shift away from the hydrocarbon and the EVs and what have you is driving incremental demand uh, in, on top of that, which would have already been a tight market irrespective of the EV push. Okay. What other industry uses uh, should we look out for uh, besides the EV market? Well, certainly housing is also going to be a, a big consumer of copper, all the wiring in a home, construction, those type of things. I think around EV infrastructure, any kind of infrastructure that uh, demands base metals uh, is going to be uh, driving and demanding copper, but it's certainly the housing market. Uh, it would be a big one. Um, tell us about some of your company updates. So Kalinex Nut Mines, uh, you've got projects um, based in uh, Manitoba and uh, and New Brunswick. Uh, so tell us about these two projects um, and uh, and recent developments. No, we're very, very excited about our flagship project at Pine Bay in northern Manitoba. We've announced last year a very high-grade resource. Uh, in the indicated category of that resource, it was grading over 3.64% copper equivalent. And 3.14% of that resource was copper. So as we kind of draw on our conversation we had earlier in terms of grades, uh, you're looking at uh, 
global copper grades, again, averaging mine production at less than half a percent, and our resource was over 3% copper at our rainbow deposit uh, at Pine Bay, which is, again, in northern Manitoba. Uh, since that time, we've made a new discovery we've named the Descendant, uh, which was initial discovery was four mineralized zones. So it's over significant widths uh, and showing strong potential. We're currently in the process of doing a, a sizable geophysical survey over this new discovery to help aid our future exploration as we look to step out in an upcoming drilling campaign later this year to start building upon another resource. And that's what we're looking to achieve at our Pine Bay property is scale in 2024. And that's gonna be driven through the discovery and advancements of these deposits uh, that are stacking up. We've made a number of discoveries, now three of them at the property uh, and looking to expand upon those discoveries here this year on the backdrop of what I believe is going to be a much stronger market for the copper space as we were discussing earlier. Can you tell us about the um, development of the mine so far? Like, which phase are you in? Are you, um, are you, do you have any drill results to report? Uh, yeah, so we're, we're very much in the exploration phase. We put out a maiden resource uh, last year that was over 5.7 million tons of high-grade copper. Uh, that resource also carried gold, silver, and zinc as byproducts. So uh, that's typical for the, the deposit style that we've, uh, we're have exploring and have discovered at Pine Bay. Uh, since that time, we made another discovery called Alchemist, and then a third one uh, called Descendant. And Descendant is in an area of the property that's had over a century of exploration and it had all the key geological indicators that a, a large deposit was lurking somewhere in that area. Uh, so we followed up uh, and we had success. We've had a number of drill holes into that. We now have... Uh, two drills into that discovery. And the grades are similar to what we're seeing at our nearby rainbow deposit, which is where we recently announced a resource. So we're quite excited to be following up to that uh, with near-term drill, drilling to, I'm sorry, drilling to commence in the, in the very near future uh, to then build another sizable resource there. And that's where we build scale at Pine Bay this year uh, is to build significant volume on the property on the backdrop of the just the maiden resource, the first pass resource that we announced uh, in July of last year. Do you have a plan, like a five-year plan, as to uh, what you what you envision these projects to look like in five years? Are you taking them to production? Are you planning for a sale? Uh, basically, what's your long-term vision here? Long-term vision is to have a, a, a large, sustainable, long-term life of mine at our Pine Bay property. Uh, and we're going to advance that through the exploration to the development and eventual production stage. We've got a technical team that's been credited with the discovery of half the mines in the camps area. Obviously, they're doing great work at our Pine Bay property with the discoveries that we've made there over the past several years. And our team has also been critical in the development of two of the largest mines in the camps history. And this is an area that's produced 32 mines. And that's another big advantage that we have in Manitoba is uh, a rule of law in a long-term you know, a mining community. Flint Falls built on mining, uh, going back over a century where mines are welcome and wanted, and uh, that leads to the opportunity to fast-track production. So where I see ourselves in five years is having grown these discoveries into a sizable resource, a very significant one, and then been on the path and transitioned into a producer uh, and scaling up from there as we develop other assets across Canada that we already have deeper in our uh, portfolio as you mentioned earlier, Eastern Canada. And uh, are you are you planning to expand your assets by discovering in other places in Canada or perhaps South America? Or are, you, are, you, are you sticking to just this jurisdiction for now? Well, we've always liked jurisdictions with proximity infrastructure. And if you look at our broader portfolio with the resource space that we have, we have over 40 million tons of resources in multiple resource reports in Eastern Canada. Uh, and, and they're really focused around known mining jurisdictions and infrastructure. What that does is it reduces our, first of all, our upfront exploration costs because we're not mobilizing people very remote and all the supplies associated with drilling where your drill costs can go up three, four times what we're paying for drilling uh, at Pine Bay there. But longer term, when you look at your development, which is your upfront capital costs in particular, it's gonna be much lower because you don't need to bring all that infrastructure in, whether it be people, power, water, all those type of things are, are big money. And so we're looking to reduce that risk by focusing on assets in uh, known jurisdictions and you know, looking forward, any kind of acquisition uh, that we would look to make uh, would be with that similar mindset. I think, again, 
You want to go where you have existing infrastructure. That infrastructure has been put in place by the pedigree of the geology. It's produced past mines. And usually, typically, you have a favorable mining environment uh, like from the locals. So um, you know, we're going to stick to that strategy and, and execute on that front. Great. Well, to, where can we learn more about your projects, Kalanex Mines, and perhaps yourself? Uh, certainly, you can visit our website at kalanex.ca. That's C-A-L-L-I-N-E-X.ca. And if you'd be inclined to become a shareholder of the company, you can do so. We trade on the OTCQX in the United States under the ticker CLLXF. And then in Canada on the Toronto Venture Exchange, where our primary listing is CNX. Okay, very good. Thanks very much, Max. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow Calinex Minds in the links down below.